It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. We have a catch up on uh, DNS over HTTP. We'll talk about some great new features coming to Chrome and Firefox. Steve sings the praises of the Chrome remote desktop and then hold on to your hats because there's bad news about SIM jacking. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 732, recorded Tuesday, September 17th, 2019. Sim jacking. Security Now is brought to you by Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technology's Advanced Technology Center is like no other testing and research lab, with over 150 different security services and applications, including OEMs like Cisco Umbrella, and it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all that it offers, go to WWT.com slash twit. And by Helm. Take back your email, files, and photos. Own your own data with Helm, a secure personal server that lets you own your own online identity. Go to thehelm.com slash security now to save $50 off the Helm personal server. And by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV provides IT training that's effective and entertaining with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash security now for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. Use the code SN30 at checkout. It's time for Security Now, the show where we talk about the latest in security and privacy and keeping yourself safe online with this guy right here, Steve Gibson. In the house. Hello, Steve. Yo, Leo. We've done a lot. Uh, We've done a lot of security now, as it feels like, in the last it, few days. It has. And, and in fact, uh, I, I made note of that. Uh, for this week, I said uh, we continue following the DOH story, which we begin discussing two weeks from now <laughs> in the future. <laughs> As a result of a rip in the space-time continuum. Exactly. Uh, we also look at recent changes to Chrome 77 mm. and the forthcoming Chrome 78. The already compromised, though not yet released, iOS 13.0. Mozilla Firefox's new browser VPN offering. And a look back at last Tuesday's Patch Tuesday. We take note of Chrome's remote desktop feature, which I just discovered, uh, cover another serious Exum email server problem, handle a bit of miscellany, and then conclude with an examination of a serious vulnerability affecting essentially all smartphone users known as SIM jacking. Oh, man, this has been a big problem. Yeah, it's it got a lot of coverage in the tech press and... I had to like, I had no idea that a SIM could be jacked. I just figured it was a <laughs> bit of, I bit, thought it was like a bit of ROM or something. But it turns out there's a browser in your SIM. It's what? like, what? Yes. And, and so the good news is that firewalls, uh, cellular carrier firewalls can be erected to stop this. But at the moment, there isn't any. They're not doing and, it. Yeah. And it's possible for bad guys to send you an SMS message which jacks your SIM <gasps> and can take over your phone. And it's like because it's <gasps> at, at down at the SIM level, it's carrier agnostic. It's phone source agnostic. It's if your phone has a SIM in there and they all do. Uh, you're in trouble. Even I an mean, eSIM, yeah, even not, an eSIM would be vulnerable to this. Yes, and it's it's not it's it's going to be targeted attacks. It's not like they're going to get right. you, you're going to get sprayed with it. But uh, for people who are subject to targeting, this is a problem. So wow. uh, anyway, we have lots of stuff to talk about. I can't wait. As always, security now. We look forward to it every week. A reminder: Steve and I are going to be in Boston. That's why we were pre-recording our October first episode on October third. Uh, we will be doing an event uh, uh, at, uh, on behalf of LastPass. It's exciting. It's a, an event about the future of authentication. It'll be Steve. It'll be the legendary uh, 
William Cheswick, Bill Cheswick, who actually created the first firewall at Bell Labs, has written a lot about security and has recently written about passwords and why they're bad. Uh, we'll also have Jerry uh, Buchholz, who is the CISO of LogMeIn. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic panel event. It is absolutely free. If you're in Boston on uh, that Thursday afternoon, October 3rd, you can go to our website, twit.to. That's the URL shortener, twit.to slash unlocked. Uh, we have, I think, some room left. They, what's happened is that they've slowly expanded the venue. <laughs> uh, it was initially 100 people, then 200. I think we're up to 350. I think they're going to have to go to five or 600, but we're slowly expanding the venue to accommodate at the Intercontinental Hotel in Boston. If you will be in the Boston area on October 3rd, twit.to slash unlocked. It's free. It's actually for charity. Everybody who attends will get a $100 token. They can donate to one of three uh, Logman's uh, three choices of charity. So that's going to be really nice, too. You get to put your token in the charity of choice. Um, and I, I can't wait to do that with you, Steve. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we have a ball. Yeah. I don't. I mean, eventually we will sell out. This may be the last round of announcements, so don't, don't delay. Our show today brought to you by Worldwide Technology. I am a really big fan. Once I understood what Worldwide Technology was doing with its advanced technology center, I was actually blown away. Worldwide Tech, WWT is a uh, enterprise technology leader. They're really, really good at what they do. And they now have uh, an amazing lab. They've been building it over the last decade. They call it their ATC, their Advanced Technology Center, with more than half a billion dollars uh, of equipment in there. All the equipment that anybody in an enterprise setting would need, things like heavyweights like Cisco and uh, NetApp and VMware, but also small emerging disruptors like Tanium and Equinix and, and Expanse. And this is used by the engineers at WWT to spin up uh, proofs of concept, uh, to, to create pilots for their customers. They have a sandbox. Customers can take a look at it, choose the right solution. Uh, it really helps reduce the time from the, the initial concept to deployment from months and months to weeks because you can test it all ahead of time, see how it's going to work. It's really an impressive product from WWT. And people who are already familiar with WWT know how good they are. I mean, their customers stay with them for years because they know that WWT is going to give you the answers you need to make sure your business runs right. Uh, what's neat about the incubator is it has labs you can use too, on-demand labs, schedulable labs, Things like Cisco's ACI segmentation migration, hundreds of other labs representing the newest advances in every area, endpoint security architecture, uh, things like software-defined networking, network automation, primary and secondary storage, of course, cloud, multi-home cloud. It's how you can learn about products before you launch. And because they offer this lab as a service, you can, you literally can use it. It's a dedicated lab space within the ATC where customers can perform their own programmatic testing using this incredible ecosystem, this half-billion-dollar ecosystem WWT's built. It's virtual. You don't have to go to St. Louis. You can use it any time of the day, 24-7. It is an amazing thing. They finally launched it. We were talking about it all summer. Their new digital platform, which encompasses the entire ATC ecosystem and really has become a multiplier effect for knowledge, speed, and agility anytime, anywhere around the world for their customers. You can get access to articles, to case studies, hands-on labs, the tools you need to make a difference in today's fast-paced world. You want to know more and you want to sign up? You can do it. Get access to their new on-demand lab platform at www.t.com slash twit. Create your account. Find out what's out there. I think you'll be very, very impressed. If you're doing IT... You need to know about WWT. WWT simplifies the complex at www.com slash twit. WWT, delivering business and technology outcomes around the world. Let's get going, Steve. So, We've got a picture. So, we got a picture. Uh, I've been sitting on this one for a while. I just get a kick out of it. It's So this is from the, uh, you know, the iconic sci-fi movie, The Terminator, with Arnold the the robot sent back in time from the future who's uh, at a phone booth looking yeah, up you remember the... he was looking for Sarah Connor he had to <laughs> find her he took exactly he took the phone book 
And so there's a scowl on his face uh, down at the bottom frame because the, in the phone book, Sarah Connor's name has been distorted with a line running through it to create a capture. I am a robot. I cannot read it. <laughs> <laughs> what have they done? Anyway. Just a little bit of geeky security I don't humor. Think these captures fool anybody, especially not uh, robots. No, they fool us more they fool, than they fool yes. you know They're robots. I'm humans. looking at the going. I don't have no idea what that <laughs> thing says. Just give me another one, please. <laughs> yes. So, Chrome follows Mozilla to DOH with a bit of a twist. Um, Google has announced that they too will soon be performing a trial of DNS over HTTPS, DOH, in the upcoming Chrome Beta 78, which will be releasing this Thursday, September 19th. We're currently at Chrome 77. Um, what's interesting is that rather than having Chrome pre-configured with a default DOH server like their own, Google will instead attempt to preserve whatever DNS the user already has chosen. And I love that idea. I think that's very clever. Um, and that it would be really cool if they were to probe the user's currently selected DNS server to see if it was offering DOH support, test it locally, then switch to it. But apparently that's a bit too aggressive, at least initially. So what, they're, what they'll be doing is only if the user has already configured their DNS to one of six providers, clean browsing, Cloudflare, DNS.SB, Google, OpenDNS, or Quad9. On the other hand, you know, those are high reputation, well-known services. And I imagine a lot of our listeners probably have done that. So initially, for a small group of users running Chrome 78 beta, Google will be running an experiment that checks to see if their provider is on that short list of well-known DOH compatible providers. And if the user's provider is Chrome will automatically upgrade to that provider's DOH server for its DNS resolution. And if they're not already using one of those servers, nothing will change. So uh, this, this will affect all platforms of Chrome other than Linux and iOS. And on Android 9 and later, if a user has already configured a DNS over TLS provider, Chrome will use that instead uh, of the ones that are listed. Um, so uh, by cleverly leaving the DNS provider as is and only upgrading to the provider's equivalent DOH service, um, what I like about this is that the user experience should remain the same. For instance, any malware site protections or parental control features that are offered by the DNS provider, which presumably the user has chosen for that reason and enabled and configured, uh, those would continue to work. If DOH fails, then Chrome will revert to the, to the provider's regular DNS service, that is not try to do DOH, uh, and any of those early adopters will be able to opt out of this with a flag, if a Chrome colon forward slash forward slash flags forward slash pound DNS hyphen over hyphen HTTPS, that'll bring you to a flag that where you which you can turn off if you don't want it. Um, uh, and on the Mozilla side, and Leo, thanks to the time machine we used last Saturday to record podcast 734. I happen to know that two weeks from now on our joy, <laughs> our joy of sync podcast, number 734, we'll be discussing Mozilla's own move to begin experimenting with enabling DOH by default for their users. But it turns out that as news of Mozilla's plans spread, 
which, by the way, I was unaware of two weeks from now due to a temporal paradox, <laughs> Mozilla will have since received some pushback from Linux distro maintainers and some network oh, admins. Oh, really? Oh, why? Yes. Hmm. In an example quoted by Bleeping Computer, OpenBSD developer Peter Hessler tweeted that OpenBSD has disabled DOH in their Firefox package in the current and future releases as, and this is what he said, quote, sending all DNS traffic to Cloudflare by default is not a good idea. So people are objecting to Mozilla's sort of default focus on a single DOH provider. Actually, that makes sense. If it's default and it's defaulting to Cloudflare, that does make sense. It should. Yes. Yeah. You yes. should have to and turn that's it on. What, and that's what is cool about what Google did was, you know, they're trying to honor the user's existing override, if any, um, rather than just saying, we're, 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 we're going to send everything to Cloudflare. Christian uh, uh, Kanon, I guess it would be Kontop, who's a senior scalability engineer, stated that Mozilla is about to, and this is a little extreme maybe, he says, about to break DNS, unquote, because Cloudflare will be used for DNS resolution over what was assigned by the system administrator, which of course is a concern. And he felt that this would leak the names of all the websites visited in a corporate environment to Cloudflare. So, you know, the, the Internet purists are, are a little annoyed by this, but users are saying, hey, you know, we, we would prefer not to have our ISP and anybody else on the wire looking at everything, you know, like using D DNS to determine everything we're doing. And it turns out that in the future – in two weeks from now, Leo, we, we note that, well, yes, but, you know, our IP address, the actual IP traffic is still somewhat of a giveaway uh, with the understanding that it doesn't disambiguate uh, multiple homed sites at a given IP, but still. So anyway, some interesting movement. And uh, ZDNet, I picked up on a tip from them that I thought was interesting for any of our listeners using Chrome now who have an interest in enabling DOH today, it turns out that that's actually supported. Uh, it, Chrome lacks any user interface for configuring this, and you really are going to want to uh, look at the show notes for this. Uh, it, it turns out that Chrome dutifully obeys launch time startup parameters, which can be added to the 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 shortcut that you use to start Chrome. Uh, so, for example, in Windows, you would modify the startup link to add a bunch of command parameters. There's hyphen hyphen enable features, and then the feature is DNS over HTTPS, and then a and then a le less than symbol DOH trial unquote. That was one parameter. The next one, force field trials, and then and then that one takes a a, a, a double quoted DOH trial forward slash group one unquote, and then force field trial params. And here's where you specify deliberately what you want to use as the DOH server. Um, and in this case, they they in the in the Example that ZDNet had, they they were using 1.1.1.1 uh, with some parameters. So again, the show notes have the details for anyone who's interested, and you can then go to, for example, 1.1.1.1 forward slash help, and and you'll get a status screen to confirm that you that your browser is resolving through uh, DNS over HTTPS. So. Anyway, just a cool little tip from ZDNet for our users who are really wanting to operate on the bleeding edge. Um, although, you know, DOH works. So um, in, in other news, uh, there is no waiting to experience Chrome's deprecation of all obvious display of EV certs. 
We've talked about this coming. Basically, sadly, the death of the probable death of EV search, because really, um, if the browser's not giving the user any affirmative, obvious indication that you, the, you are at a site who who has who has paid extra for extended validation, you know, as they did for a while, you got the nice big. It was like in green Gibson Research Corporation, woo, -hoo! and that's gone. So I have in the show notes two screenshots showing uh, grc.com and wikipedia.org. grc.com is EV, no indication. Oh, and by the way, www. For both GRC and Wikipedia are gone, and so uh, G Chrome is still or back to doing that again. They decided, ah, no one cares about www, even though, okay, well, it's there in the URL. Yeah, um, and there are a lot of the, links, right? But it still works. The links will work, right? Yes, the links work. It just doesn't. It, you know, I guess the argument it. is. People don't care. Right. And, you know, and, and you do see, for example, grc.com forward slash intro dot htm, where that's now the 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 tail is is a, a dimmer gray, whereas grc.com is strong. So right. they're sort of they're, they're 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 sort of trying to say, you know, this is where you are. But they're just the, like for www it's like, eh, no one cares. OK. Anyway, what the so I. I clicked on the show me more to get the drop down. And so this is now the only indication, which for all intents and purposes, who even knows? You can see that if I, I clicked on the tell me more um, for GRC and under the certificate, which it shows as valid, it says issued to Gibson Research Corporation. So that versus Wikipedia, where Wikipedia, that's not an EV cert, just says certificate valid and nothing else. So, you know, given the fact that non-EV certs have a longer life compared to EV, I think EV is limited to two years. Non-EV can be three. Uh, and if the browsers aren't showing you any benefit, it's like, eh, it's going to be hard to justify the additional cost and the fact that you got to do that. Uh, every two years versus getting an extra year of of time. So uh, that's in Chrome 77 now, and uh, I think it really represents a death knell for extended validation, which is, you know, unfortunate because uh, you did have to jump through additional hoops. Although, you know, there have been arguments that, for example, there could be a Gibson Research Corporation in a different – that was incorporated in a different state – and so that's not going to, you know, it's going to confuse people. Wait a minute. I thought I was at uh, GRC and now it says right. Gibson Research Corporation, but it's some other domain name. So I guess I can understand that. So this is Firefox and it does show the owner uh, if you have an extended cert. But if you don't uh, like Wikipedia, it just says uh, this website does not supply ownership information. Ah, so so this Firefox is, is, Firefox, is yeah. ah, there it is, nice big green. Right. Yep. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see how, what if Mozilla fo uh, follows suit. You know what they you know what their position is on this. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's over as far as Chrome goes, and of course, Chrome is as we know the majority browser on the net. Right. So uh, lucky iOS thirteen. Um, we're getting iOS 13 in two days on Thursday, September 19th. Uh, and frankly, I'm excited for one feature in particular. I love swipey phone keyboards or, or ta tab <laughs> tablet keyboards. I really do. But I've never been happy with any of the third-party iOS add-on keyboards. I've tried them all. Gboard, Swipe, SwiftKey, and, you know, and their, their ilk. Um, and I found that they all behave, they all misbehave in various ways, most often by failing to deploy when they are needed. So, you know, you'll sometimes come to a form and you like tap in the field and like it like sometimes the bottom will blank out and it's like, hello, <laughs> I need a keyboard here. <laughs> Nothing. So 
anyway, uh, I'm iOS 13 finally has a swipey keyboard built in. And I say yay, because I would just love to stay with the one that will hopefully deploy when it's supposed to, uh, unlike any of the, like all of those third-party keyboards don't. I predict um, in a future episode, you will also, <laughs> whether we've done it or not, I don't know, but you will also find uh, praise for iOS 13's privacy measures. They really now... Recognizing that the biggest problem with iOS, thir iOS is the third-party apps. You know, yep. Apple can lock everything down, but if Facebook sucks, you know, it sucks. So, in fact, if you when you first sucks put, your data, it sucks, sucks your, your data. data. When you put iOS yeah. 13 on, all of a sudden you're going to get a cascade of warnings from Facebook saying, hey, they're looking at your location. Here's the map. You know, I think this is really good. Apple is wow. aggressively. That's going to force behavior on, on uh, other sites. Well, what it forced Facebook to do is already publish an article saying, here's why we really should know where you are. <laughs> This is, <laughs> please don't. And it even says, you know, we recommend you don't. You always allow us to look at your location. We strongly recommend that. So, yeah, yeah get and I ready. heard I heard I heard Renee mention that uh, Pokemon uh, like he, he he gets a pop up every week. He wants to say, yeah, oh, by by right. the way, it's still right. you know you it, it's still got your location information. And I I think that kind of a of a persistent reminder is you know very cool. Basically, as Steve Jobs said this years ago, he said, "Let them know, let them know again, make them let make them tell you to stop letting me know." Because yep. people, uh, and Renee's concern, which is legitimate, is that people might just go, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think so. I've already experienced this. I've been using the beta for some time. It is a great, I really appreciate it. And I always say, do not allow unless, you know, usually uh, if it's a mapping app, I just say, don't allow unless the app's open. If I've opened the app, yeah, you got to look at where you are. There's no reason in that map app needs to know where I am if it's not running. Right. Or Facebook or anything else. So I think right. it's... I, and as, especially if these things are power consumers also. Yes. If it If it's like draining your battery because it wants to keep you, like an eye on you, it's like, no, no go away. Go away. Yeah. So uh, you, you've been using the beta. It, it has a swipey keyboard, right? I actually haven't tried it. I should try it. Oh, Leo. <laughs> okay, well, I'm dying. I, I got, I mean, I for me, it's just like such a convenience to oh, have. Oh, I far prefer yep. swipe. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, of course, I use, yeah. uh, on my Android devices, I use it all the time because the, the default keyboard always on Android has it. I don't know. Yeah. Let me uh, let me start typing well, something. And well, see. well, I well, I tell our users why we won't be using 13.0 for long. Yeah. It turns out. That we will be jumping to 13.1 very soon the after the release, yeah. uh, yes, of 13.0, since a headline-grabbing lock screen bypass bug oh, is already oh. already known to oh. exist, and it still exists in the Golden Master version of iOS 13 that has already been loaded into the many hundreds of thousands of iPhones in shipping containers out there on the high seas. Ah, now I understand. Ah. Yeah, iOS 13 contains a vulnerability that allows anyone to bypass the lock screen protection to access sensitive information this on that user's phone. This has historically been a problem on Apple for years. Yes, well, it, and you know, it's because there are just so many of those accessibility and Siri and convenience features, they, 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 they just keep finding a way around. In fact, this guy, Jose Rodriguez, uh, he found the one on that was the bypass. I think it was in 12.1. Uh, so he's revealed that he discovered a lock screen bypass bug in 13 that allowed him to access the full list of contacts on his iPhone and every piece of information saved within them. Jose discovered the newly introduced lock screen bypass bug on his own iPhone while he was running the iOS 13 beta and reported it immediately to Apple two months ago, actually exactly two months ago on July 17th. However, even that was apparently too late for Apple to do anything about it. They had already got their supply chain ramped up and were stamping out iOS 13 into all the phones that they were prepping for, you know, the big release. So 
that bypass remains working in the golden master version of iOS 13, which we all get in two days. Even those of us who aren't jumping on new pads or phones, and I'm not because, I mean, I, I, I did watch all of your coverage on it uh, last Tuesday, and uh, it's like, yeah, okay. Uh, not, you know, I'm not a huge camera person, um, but I definitely want iOS 13. So uh, we'll be able to get iOS 13 in two days. Uh, the lock screen bug is like those we've seen before, where someone having physical access to a targeted iPhone is able to trick the phone into granting them access to the full list of stored contacts, as well as detailed information for each individual contact, including names, phone numbers, emails, and so forth, using a FaceTime call. Um, this is also similar to the, the same one that Jose discovered last year in iOS 12.1, just a few hours after Apple released 12.1. It allowed anyone to bypass the phone's lock screen using the built-in voiceover feature. Um, uh, th so this bug requires activating a FaceTime call on the target iPhone and then accessing Siri's voiceover support feature to obtain access to the contact list and all the information saved there. However... The problem won't exist for long as it is very much expected to be patched in 13.1, which is expected to begin trickling out to the public 11 days later on Monday, September 30th. So if this really worries you, you could disable automatic updates until October 1st and jump right over from 12.4.1 where we are today over to 13.1 and, you know, skip that. But I'm not worried about it. You know, besides, you, so you have someone has to physically have your phone in order to get to your contact. So, and there's a not know. insignificant amount of fiddling they have to do. So they'd have to have your phone <laughs> yes, without you true. looking at them for some, you know, a yes. minute or two. Because there's, as that we just ran true. the video, it's a lot of steps. It's not an easy yep. thing. Yeah. Yep. And Leo, in another of those bizarre time travel paradoxes in the future yes. two weeks from now yes. during episode 734 i have it on very good authority that i will mention that cloudflare is launching a mobile device oriented vpn whereupon you inform me of the just breaking news from the past <laughs> that mozilla is also launching a privacy-focused VPN service. Yeah. Um, that takes me by surprise, once again, because we've been messing around with the space-time continuum <laughs> for the benefit of our faithful listeners. You know, we'll do anything for our listeners. Yes. So due to the time warp, today, two weeks earlier than then, I am now mm. fully up to speed oh, on Mozilla's <laughs> announcement, even though I'll know nothing about it two weeks from now ago. That's because I'm about to use the neuralizer on Steve, and That's he's going to forget right. everything. Yes. In any event, Mozilla has indeed officially launched a new privacy-focused VPN service called Firefox Private Network. It runs as a browser extension to encrypt all of a Firefox user's online activity and limiting what websites and advertisers know about Firefox users. That is, those who might have been, you know, watching. Uh, the Firefox private network service is currently undergoing beta testing and is available only to desktop users in the U.S., as part of Mozilla's recently reborn Firefox test pilot program that lets users try out new experimental features before they're officially released. The Firefox test pilot program we talked about a long time ago. It was initially launched by, by Mozilla three years ago, but was shut down at the beginning of this year. Anyway, Mozilla has decided to bring it back in an updated and changed fashion. Marissa Wood, the vice president of product uh, development at Mozilla, said the difference with 
the newly relaunched test pilot program is that these products and services may be outside the Firefox browser and will be far more polished and just a step shy of being ready for general public release. So this newly announced Firefox private network is the is part of this relaunched test pilot program's first new project. And as we would expect from any VPN, uh, the Firefox private network masks its user's IP address from third-party uh, trackers and protects sensitive information like the websites you visit and your, and your financial information when using public Wi-Fi. However, it's important to note, of course, that all by itself, it's not offering any anti-tracking protection since these days that's primarily done from within the browser and is not dependent upon IP addresses which change as mobile users switch hotspots, cellular regions, you know, and jump between home and office and so forth. So, uh, you know, and, and uh, as you will note in the future, Leo, uh, this does only, this is only a benefit for the browser session, not your your mobile platform or your desktop, you know, in general. Future um, Leo is so smart. You were right on the ball. <laughs> Just the uh, you know car the Carmack of Twit of Twit Network. I foresee. <laughs> so Mozilla says it's it's Firefox private network quote provides a secure encrypted path to the web to protect your connection and your personal information anywhere and everywhere you use your Firefox browser. So my feeling is a built-in facility uh, which is easy to use and, and provides useful VPN services to many people who might not otherwise go to all the trouble to set up a VPN, you know, seems like a good idea. Um, it, as we noted, encrypts and, and tunnels internet browsing activity, but only your browser activity through a collection of remote proxy servers, uh, which thereby mask the user's actual location and block third parties like your ISP or your hotspot provider, anybody who might be sniffing on you, including the government, for example, from snooping on your browser traffic. Uh, at least until it emerges from the other end of the VPN connection. Now, interestingly, the proxy servers used by Firefox private network are also provided by Cloudflare. So it looks like Mozilla and wow. Cloudflare, yeah, hmm. have agreed to provide strong privacy controls to limit what data Cloudflare may collect and for how long it may store any data. We've often on this podcast, and I've heard you talking about it just the other day about a VPN, we've talked about VPN services, and one of the many issues is whether they log, and if so, what log retention policies they follow. Right. Cloudflare has stated, quote, Cloudflare only observes, observes a limited amount of data about the HTTP, HTTPS requests that are sent to the Cloudflare proxy via browsers with an active Mozilla extension. When requests are sent to the Cloudflare proxy, Cloudflare will observe your IP address, the IP address for the internet property you are accessing, source port, destination port, timestamp, and a token provided by Mozilla that indicates that you are a Firefox private network user. We call this proxy data. All proxy data will be deleted within 24 hours. So they're being very clear about, about what they are observing, collecting, and what their retention policy is. So um, anyway, anyone who is interested, uh, our listeners, uh, again, only on d desktop Firefox. Um, it is slated to be available to mobile Firefox users as well once the VPN exits its beta stage. Uh, and although it's currently free, 
Mozilla has hinted that the company is exploring the possibility of adding, uh, you know, value added commercial service pricing options in the future so that it's able to, to be a self-sustaining service. Uh, anybody who has a Firefox account, uh, you know, and for example, you, you use that in order to sync Firefox shortcuts and favorites and links and things between browsers. Um, if you go to <clears throat> HTTPS colon slash slash private hyphen network dot firefox dot com, you can sign up and join the beta and then all of your Fire Firefox desktop browsing usage gets proxied by Cloudflare and you are in a secure browser tunnel um, for all of the browser stuff you do, which I think seems like a good idea. And Leo, we're about to do a Patch Tuesday Redux. Oh boy. But let's take our second uh, break and then we will proceed. Just in the nick of time, I have this. Uh, I little, know what that is. Pyramid in my hot little hands. <laughs> it is the Helm. It was my email server. It is now the Helm personal server. We talk about privacy all the time on this show. And I think one of the issues a lot of people have, you will be talking about on October 1st, this notion of putting your data in a cloud, your files, your photos, your email, means that whoever that cloud provider is often has access to that information. Now, one way to solve this is to run your own private cloud. And that's what this beautiful little pyramid does. This is my Helm personal server. I've been using this for some time. I first met Gary and the Helm team, oh, it must be uh, six months ago, eight months ago, uh, on the new screensavers. And when they first started, it was just doing email. But, you know, doing email out of your house is complicated because most home IP addresses are blocked by most email companies because, hey, if you're sending email out of your house, you're probably inadvertently sending spam. So that's a problem. In fact, in most cases, your ISP will also block outbound email because that's another problem. On the internet, Helm has figured this out. They've solved it uh, with this amazing Helm personal server. 128 bit uh, gigabytes of storage in here right now, uh, upgradable because they have, as you can see, two Type C connectors on the back to up to five terabytes of storage. It's solid state. It's all encrypted using strong encryption, of course, and it does do backups using IPsec to an encrypted store on Helm's servers, but it's encrypted. In fact, this USB key, which comes with your Helm, is where you store your recovery keys. You plug it right into the top there, put your recovery keys on there. And now only you can access what's on this server and what's on the Helm backup. You can, it's full disk encryption. The keys are managed by a, a hardware secure enclave, so that's nice. It's secure boot, so it's very secure itself. Your uh, TLS encryption is provided by Let's Encrypt. The certificate's automatically updated every 90 days. You're using, in order to set up the email, proximity-based two-factor authentication. You need to put the Helm app on your smart device, and then you use it to set up and control your Helm server. Uh, it also runs NextCloud, so you've got Helm files on here now. This is something relatively new. That means file sync, file sharing, photo backup. You can easily upload, view, and share your files and photos securely. They're working on, and I'm really excited to see this, a VPN service that will also run on this Helm device. This is an amazing device. If you want to read the technical details, I don't have time in the ad to do that. Although I did spend quite a bit of time with their technical people learning how this all works. I was very impressed. There's a great article on The Intercept Michael Lee wrote in April describing the technical details about this. I highly recommend it. That's theintercept.com. Look for Michael Lee's article on Helm. Setup, it takes less than five minutes. Your Helm server will be accessible anywhere in the world, of course, because it's, it's on the Internet. Uh, your email is authenticated with DMARC, SPF, and DKIM. That's really a big deal. That also helps it get to where it's going. I, I just think you're going to love this thing. If you've been thinking about, I ought to set up my own home server, but then get daunted by the issues involved, and there are quite a few, you've got to take a look at the Helm. Very affordable, very easy to use and very safe and secure. Privacy is a right, not a setting. You want to protect what matters with Helm. For a limited time, you can save $50 on the Helm personal server by visiting thehelm.com slash security. Now, I'm going to run over to the site right now and see what their delivery date. These have sold so well 
They're hard. They're having a hard time keeping these in stock. If you order today, estimated shipping. Oh, this is good news. Within the next two weeks, so they're kind of kind of catching up by the end of September. That's very very good news. The Helm, t h e h e l m dot com slash security now. All my email goes through a Helm. I stopped using Gmail and started using the Helm. It's great for file syncing. It is it is an awesome device, and I think you're going to really like it. The Helm. dot com slash security now. Shipping now in just a couple of weeks. That's really good news. They're catching up to the demand. All right, Steve Arino. So um, last Tuesday was September's Patch Tuesday. Yes. And it did not disappoint. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it depends on what you were hoping for. That's true. There was a lot it provided. There. It provided fixes for a whopping 79 Jeez. vulnerabilities. Remember, remember when it was 16, Leo? Remember uh, those quaint those yeah. quaint days of yesteryear? It's not getting better, yeah. is it? Wow. No, it's really not. And 17 of those 79 vulnerabilities were considered to be critical. Among the many, we received a further fix for last month's very worrisome CTF flaws which were discovered and explored in excruciating detail by Google's Tavis Ormandy. As we'll recall, Tavis discovered how unprivileged attackers could launch their attack code with elevated privileges by leveraging this CTF client and server system in Windows. Um, and we've long since been disabused of the notion that elevation of privilege is nothing to worry about because it can, as we have seen, really be leveraged uh, to the advantage of attackers. So during the previous Patch Tuesday in August, Microsoft dealt with one of the related vulnerabilities, CTF vulnerabilities, but at the time they indicated there was still more to come. So as part of this month's offerings, Microsoft has released another fix for this range of flaws um, titled Windows Text Service Framework Elevation of Privilege Vulnerability and addressed another one. Quoting Microsoft, they said, an elevation of privilege vulnerability exists in Windows Text Service Framework when the TSF server process does not validate the source of input or commands it receives. And that is, of course, what Tavis found, uh, although he took him a lot of, he worked on it, I think, for a month. Um, an attacker who successfully exploited this vulnerability could inject commands or read input sent through a malicious input method editor, IME. This only affects systems that have installed an IME. To exploit this vulnerability, an attacker would first have to log on to the system an attacker could then run a specially crafted application that could exploit the vulnerability to take control of an effective system. And <laughs> you never want attackers to take control of your system. That's you're not going to have a good day. Uh, the system update, the, uh, the security update addresses this vulnerability by correcting how the TSF server and client validate input from each other. So as we know, uh, the other continuously troubled area of Windows has recently has been remote desktop. So we also, in this month's patch batch, we get four more fixes to the RDP's client side fix. Remember that we saw this also the previous month. Microsoft was clearly looking at this code, this code, the RDP code, not only on the server side, which has been a victim of exploitation recently, but also on the client side. And they have found it wanting. Uh, so there are four more fixes of what is really not such a big problem, uh, which Microsoft has discovered. Um, but now that they're looking at it and giving it, a, you know, the focus of their attention, they're finding more things to be fixed. I consider it really not such a big problem because on being on the client side, this would only affect people who connected their remote desktop protocol client to a malicious server. 
And I think most people are connecting them to their home base, which is probably not malicious. Um, if it is, you <laughs> probably have bigger problems. Anyway, Microsoft, all, again, said remote code execution vulnerabilities exist in the Windows remote desktop client when a user connects to a malicious server. An attacker who successfully exploited this vulnerability could execute arbitrary code on the computer of the connecting client. An attacker could then install programs, view, change, or delete data, or create new accounts with full user rights. And, you know, blah, 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 uh, you, you'd have to connect to a bad server, or a man in the middle could, could also uh, interject traffic that would co uh, cause a problem. So that was fixed last week. Um, oh, we should also note that Microsoft has said that three of those four vulnerabilities have been publicly disclosed and two of them have known exploits. So hopefully by now, since that was last Tuesday, everybody has run themselves an update and reboot cycle on their, on their important machines uh, and uh, has got those fixed, even though I don't think it's that big a problem to start with. One of those 17 critical vulnerabilities, which was also fixed this month, is a VB script remote code execution vulnerability. So it's just as well, as we have previously noted, that Microsoft will be throwing in the towel on VB script in favor of the now industry-wide standard ECMAScript, also known as JavaScript, since, as we all also too well know, uh, legacy usage and dependency will continue for VB script forever. I'm sure there are corporations that have, you know, written gobs of VB script stuff and they need it to, even though it has no future, uh, they need it to, you know, stay around. And so it's a good thing that Microsoft is continuing to fix it. And Microsoft said a remote code execution vulnerability exists in the way VB script engine handles objects in memory. The vulnerability could corrupt memory in such a way that an attacker could execute arbitrary code in the context of the current user. An attacker who successfully exploited this vulnerability could gain the same user rights as the current user, blah, blah, blah. So hopefully enterprise use is the only place we will see this and that it will disappear from the public internet because uh, at some point you're probably going to want to disable VB script usage out on the public internet. Uh, you know, I mean, it's good that these things are being patched, but you know, this has always been there and you don't want it, you know, you don't want to have your system taken over remotely by visiting a site that hosts a malicious ad because an advertisement that is, you know, being served from an ad, uh, an ad rotating service uh, could run script on your browser and do bad stuff to you. So not good. And I just wanted to take a moment to make sure everybody knows about something I was completely unaware of. And Leo, I'm you, you, I'm sure you know about this because apparently it's been around for a couple of years. Well, and that's also I live in the future. Oh, that you have that benefit, <laughs> don't you? You're bringing us wisdom from yes. the future. Yes, that's it. I, however, code an assembly language, oh, so yes. I am stuck in the past. Oh my God, have you? Are you? Chrome Remote Desktop. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Really? That oh my God! Excited, huh? uh, well, it's just so simple. Right. It's so easy. Right. I think and they did so, it for Chromebooks initially because it just you know you, you kind of need it on a Chromebook. Right. Because well, you, in fact, you could just consider it that to be a remote desktop client right. where you don't actually load any apps there. You just right. run things on a desktop at home. Precisely. Yeah. So, so uh, my beloved Lori. Uh, uh, um, had a need to work with a client of hers who was just really unskilled with computers. Um, she was doing remote neurofeedback oh, wow. and, and needed to set up this client's computer and 
I mean, there was just like she had to get on to her desktop. And so uh, I looked, I, I said, oh, we have no problem. Uh, Windows, it's a built into it's Windows. Built in. it's, RDP, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and there is that, what is it? Uh, it? There is remote desktop protocol, but there's remote assistance. Right. And so I showed her how that worked. And she, like Lori was saying, oh, you know, honey, You're that's going to that's gonna be, that's uh. gonna be too much. And so there was like, you know, a bunch of commercial services that were doing it, but they were like, you know, they the, the, the good ones weren't free and blah, blah, blah. And finally, I stumbled on remotedesktop.google.com. And it's like, oh, my God. And so, I mean, all, so it's like, anyway, I just wanted to make sure I wanted to bring it to our listeners' attention. I'm sure that our, our listeners are from time to time having to help somebody that really, you know, just like we, they should not have a computer, but they have one anyway. And so, wow, if you, if you are, um, in fact, I don't even think you need Chrome. You originally did. But now you need, they have revamped it. You need a browser that supports WebRTC. And may, maybe that's to, I think that you need WebRTC to be on the controller side. I think you probably still need Chrome, the Chrome browser, to be on the side which is taken over. So... Uh, but you know, again, Chrome is the majority browser on the internet and you just go to there and you click a button and it downloads an, an extension to Chrome and you can then view their desktop and wow. So anyway, just a little, uh, just a little heads up because boy, I mean, in terms of a slam dunk for, for helping somebody who who really, you know, has a hard time pushing buttons. Like, do I click once or twice? And, well, actually, that is a, a question for the ages. Um, it's just a win. So, uh, yay. Yeah, and it's free. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's free. Yeah. Uh, and works through NAT and, uh, I mean, you know, because well, yeah, everybody's... Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. NAT, yeah. NAT traversal, and I'm just, I was very impressed with this thing, so... Works um, with Firefox. Oh, At least that's uh, I just said. Yes, that. Yeah, that, yeah. yes, that that is exactly what I, I was going to say. And, and so Firefox, in addition, and and of course that also probably means it will work with the new Edge. If it doesn't work with the old Edge, I imagine it probably does work with the old Edge. But we know it'll work with the Edge based on Chromium, uh, Credge or something. What 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 is it? You and Mary Jo and Paul were Credge, calling yes. the Chromium Credge. Edge. Credge. 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 Web RTC is a, RTC is such a great standard. You can use it for yes. video calls, for phone calls. Uh, yep. Really, this is really, uh, it's working well. I think it's great. Yeah. And it's browser We're really moving, moving to the future where, where you have been for quite some time. I'm, Leo. I'm glad you finally got here. Yeah. So Exim, we at uh, Exim email servers are in trouble again. I wanted to make sure uh, this news is a little old because I just, it had been on my list of things to get to. Uh, and I hadn't been able to get to it until now, but it's important. Um, we first talked about them several months ago. This was that bizarre, it takes a week to exploit the server thing. Remember, Leo, where you you uh, you would be a client of a, a vulnerable server, and they were all vulnerable, and you'd you'd basically create a bogus email and then send them a byte a minute so that the connection wouldn't time out and then something would get tired after a week of waiting for this thing, that this final email message to get sent. It wouldn't happen. So then it would tend to, it would try to send you a bounce message, but in the envelope that you had sent, you had put um, shell commands, you know, exec shell commands in like the the mail bounce or if, if the, the 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 reply to whatever it was, which this this XM server would execute. So even though it, you had to be patient, 
you would be able to to execute as root any commands which you had stuck into the email envelope and then and then waited which i argued a worm would be able to take great advantage of and in fact there were worms that were doing this as it turns out not surprisingly well unfortunately xm is back again with another problem this one is way worse the XM maintainers have released XM version 4.92.2 after publishing an early warning two days beforehand to give sysops an early heads up that they would really need to patch this as soon as this went public because they knew that bad guys were going to jump on it. And it affects all email server versions up to and including the its immediate predecessor 4.92.1 and just to remind everyone why this matters xm is a widely used open source mail transfer agent uh, for all unix like operating systems linux uh, os x or mac os uh, uh, solaris etc and it is currently behind nearly 60 percent of the internet's email servers today. So it's the majority email transfer agent. This new vulnerability is CVE 2019-15846, affecting, as I mentioned, all XM servers previous to the one that was patched only recently, which accept TLS connections. Um, And of course, that's now considered best practice. GRC, you know, accepts TLS connections. Uh, but the fault that was discovered allows attackers to obtain root level access to the system by sending an SNI, that's the server name identification, ending in a backslash null sequence during the initial TLS handshake. Whoopsie. Uh, As we know, SNI is an extension to the TLS protocol, which allows servers to host multiple TLS certificates on a single IP. It allows a connecting client to tell the server in the first TLS packet which server certificate it wants to use for this TLS connection. And according to the XIM team, since this vulnerability does not depend on the specific TLS library being used by the server, both GNU TLS and Open SSL are affected. Um, and though the drop-in default configuration of the XM mail server software does not have TLS enabled by default, since TLS certs need to be supplied and configured, that makes sense, Still, some operating systems do bundle XM with the default vulnerable feature enabled. So what this means is immediately a large, large population of XM servers are vulnerable. Uh, And there's no question. We did verify three months ago when the, the previous vulnerability was made public that XM servers declare their version in their hello message when they answer a connection, which means it is very easy for Shodan to index them by version and for bad guys to find them. And this does, you don't have to wait wait a week now to take one over. You can do so instantly. So with any luck, this is old news to any of our listeners who may be responsible for XM servers. Uh, if not, you want to update to 4.92.2 immediately. Um, also, a follow-up from a listener last week. I'm, I'm not sure which time space-time continuum we're in, Leo, but I think it was last week, uh, who I was complaining, or I, I, I mentioned the uh, the... Firefox browser memory consumption problem and how the I was recommending an add-on. I think somebody in the chat room, because I remember you supplied the information on the fly, Leo, mentioned that there was an 
a a an about colon config switch in Firefox, which was disabled by default. It was browser.tabs.unload on low memory. It defaults to false. Right. And I said, yay, I didn't know about that. I'm going to turn it on, and next week I will know because my the, the whole process I go through for building the show is to have a bunch of tabs open. I had 40-some open at the beginning of production of this podcast. Wow. So I turn, I set it to true, and memory consumption immediately fell. Woohoo! So Yay. it works. So, yes, uh, to all of our listeners, if you're a Firefox user and you have multiple tabs open in a memory lean machine. Uh, I only have a eight gigs, as I mentioned, on the Lenovo X1 that I use in a, I use it in a, in a closed configuration with, with a, with a Lenovo dock just, you know, in my other location. But unfortunately eight gigs is all the Ram it's got, which is a little tight these days. And, um, uh, it, this really solves the problem for me. So thank you, uh, uh, listener or chat room person for mentioning that it, it works great. And I want to let everyone know. Also, we've been talking about ransomware a lot recently because ransomware. Uh, so I wanted to note something that someone tweeted in my direction, which was that windows 10 windows defender includes a ransomware protection feature, which enables various protections against ransomware. You know, I, we were talking about, um, uh, and will be actually in the future, Leo, to, <laughs> two weeks, talking about uh, synchronization and how having system file sync systems which store previous versions is good protection against ransomware. Well, it turns out that Windows 10 also builds some in. Um, however, it is disabled by default because it requires some some hand holding and tuning, and it's not for the faint of heart. But I wanted to point out that it is there and that it is useful and it works. It involves two features. One is controlled folder access, and the other is ransomware data recovery. Controlled folder access will is definitely disabled by default, and it will definitely cause you some annoyance while it's being trained, which is why I'm sure Microsoft has it off by default. And, and what, what really surprised me is that it even blocks Microsoft's own apps like IE and Edge. Uh, which I thought, well, okay, maybe they're just trying to be really even-handed here. But once it's been trained, it will definitely be useful uh, until and unless it, too, is bypassed somehow. You know, everything ha ends up being bypassed eventually. But maybe maybe it's rooted so deeply in the kernel that it's going to be difficult to, ha to have that happen. Um, it will probably keep unknown baddies from touching your user data filled directories, you know, like everything in the my, you know, underneath your documents, you know, the, the things you tend to do. Um, the second component is ransomware data recovery, which automatically syncs those same common user data directories up with your Microsoft OneDrive to keep those files backed up. Um, uh, and anyway, so ransomware victims uh, with this feature enabled can then use OneDrive to recover their files if they ever become encrypted with ransomware. And I don't know how Microsoft does this, but presumably there's something going on where it's not going to get fooled if a if a if a if a if the if it already has a file that's been backed up ransomware won't, you know, it, it, it won't back, it won't overwrite that on OneDrive if it's changed by ransomware. Uh, maybe some heuristic that Microsoft is employing where suddenly the entire fire, the entire file changes dramatically. Microsoft says, eh, not so fast there. 
I, I wasn't able to, to get any specific information about how that works. Um, but, uh, I, I do know that controlled folder access is a useful but painful feature. Um, I had to enable it, uh, Toward, toward the end of my work on the Squirrel client, because Squirrel puts its the, stores its user Squirrel identity un, in a Squirrel folder under the user's documents, uh, and also Squirrel has a self-install feature that really freaked out Windows 10 because you know installing themselves is what malware wants to do also. Um, so th that's how I learned a lot about controlled folder access. And essentially you're getting, you're getting notifications constantly that, um, of things that are wanting to write into your documents folder. So you're having to say, you know, look at what it is and go, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so there's sort of an exponential fall off of yeah. Okay's that you're needing to explicitly do. But frankly, uh, I like the idea of having to whitelist things because, again, the the need to train them falls off pretty rapidly over time, and then you end up with a system that's pretty well locked down. So, anyway, I just wanted to put that on everybody's map uh, as something to consider. And Leo, time for our last break, and then we're going to look at sim jacking. I can't wait. This is a hot topic right now. And I don't, Oof, honestly boy. don't know what the answer is for, for normal people. I mean, this this is a tough thing there, to solve. Yes. I, yeah. Yes. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. First, a word from our sponsor, IT Pro TV. We love IT Pro TV. We went out there. Uh, Lisa and I did a couple of, well, was it more than a year ago now? Maybe a year and a half ago when they opened their brand new facility in Gainesville, Florida five count them five live studios recording all day to create the best online training for it topics whether you're new and you want to get into the business for that you often need those certifications it's a great way that's how they started to, to get the cert training in fact they are the official partner um for a uh, comp tia they've got 12 comp tia courses those are those are some of the most in-demand certs for people starting out in IT. Uh, A plus for IT, you know, people fixing computers and stuff. Security plus, uh, great trainings. That, well, they were selected by CompTIA for the training. It's official. That, that partly because IT Pro is great, but they're IT professionals themselves. But they have a little something extra. They're really good at presenting and explaining. So the, the, the training from IT Pro TV is fun. It's engaging. You will learn. It's all done in an interactive talk show format. In fact, much like us, they have a chat room going on. Actually, it's no accident. They basically admit they completely copied us. <laughs> and I was thrilled because this is something we don't do is IT training. So there was a lot of room for what IT Pro TV does. You'll learn about uh, common tools, techniques, practices, it's security. In fact, this is one of their most, I asked them the other day, I had uh, lunch in Orlando with uh, Tim and Don, the founders of IT Pro uh, TV, and they said that secu their security training they do is right now some of the hottest training they do. And, and that is also even for existing IT professionals who need to know how to secure their facilities. You know, I think we should send some uh, city government folks over there, <laughs> over there too. Uh, their security courses include pen testing tools, cryptography, malware detection, it is, it is the best place to get a job in IT. And I know if you watch this show, you deserve a job in IT. A lot of IT professionals watch. I want to encourage you to check out IT Pro TV too because it's a great way to learn new skills in the pursuit of your career. IT is always changing. IT Pro TV wants to help you stay ahead of it all. They go from web uh, studio to web in 24 hours. They have more than 4,000 hours of on-demand content right now in every area. You can become a part of IT Pro TV's family. There are two memberships. There's a standard membership, which is just the video. A lot of people get their feet wet. But on the other hand, if you are going to take tests, if you want to learn so that you can get a job, you might want to do the premium membership because you get the video, of course, but you also get online labs that let you set up, configure Windows servers, Windows clients, things like that. 
you can mess things up <laughs> in the lab before you mess them up in real life. There's also practice exams. So if you are taking a certification exam, you can practice the test before you take the test. That is hugely valuable. Here's the deal. Don't wait. Go to IT Pro TV. It's visit go.itpro.tv slash security now. That'll let them know you saw it here. Uh, when we were at the event, about three quarters of the people at that grand opening are security now viewers. I think I think a lot of their business comes from people who watch the show. That would be no surprise. If you have that much interest in what we're talking about, you really ought to be an IT professional. Go.itpro.tv slash security now. The offer code SN30 is pretty magical. It will unlock 30% savings. And not just for the first month or the first year, but for as long as you stay active, you will save 30% over everybody else which makes it a really affordable choice. A lot cheaper than a technical school. Better training, if you ask me. More fun, more engaging. You can watch it everywhere. It's, they've got apps for iOS, Android, Roku, Apple TV, everywhere you would watch. The web, of course. IT Pro TV. Build or expand your IT career. Enjoy the journey, too. It is fun to watch. I actually know people who don't work in IT. They're not trying to get a job in IT. They watch it because they enjoy it because they love the information. Visit go.itpro.tv slash security now. And remember, SN30 gets you 30% off for life. Okay, Steve, let's return to the present. Okay, you got to look at the logo. Um, it's <laughs> animated. Uh, they, they, they did S, or S, uh, what's that? SJV, S, 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 SVJ animation oh, on yeah. the on the header of the site and it's just it's just wonderful s i m j a c k e r oh, dot com simjacker so the dot sim, com but what, and there it is watch carefully ah! turns ah! into a voodoo mask <laughs> I love it. it'll 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 repeat that's really good that's really i cute. loved it they did a really nice job yeah. Arr! Arr! so um oops Unfortunately, that's the end of the good news. Um, <laughs> that's the end of the funny stuff. <laughs> that's, oh, the boy. rest is not. The rest is not funny. And when I read this, I, like, what? Your 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 what? Uh, it's a new SIM card flaw. And get this, not theoretical, not like some university saying, oh, you know, maybe if uh, if the moon is full and you click your heels. Three times you can, you know, leak some data from an Intel uh, side channel. No, this is discovered being actively exploited in the wild, which allows attackers to hijack any capital all bold any phone just by sending it an SMS message, which is like what? Uh, so uh, this this comes from Adaptive Mobile Security. And in their overview, they said adaptive mobile security have uncovered a new and previously undetected vulnerability and associated exploits called SimJacker. This vulnerability is currently being actively exploited by a specific private company that works with governments to monitor individuals. What? Uh -huh. Oh, man. Yeah. SimJacker and its associated exploits is a huge jump in complexity and sophistication compared to attacks previously seen over mobile core networks. The main SimJacker attack involves an SMS containing a specific type of spyware-like code being sent to a mobile phone, which then instructs, and this is where I'm going, like, wait a minute, have we just jumped the shark here? Instructs the SIM card within the phone to take over the mobile phone to receive and perform sensitive commands. And, th and I did some digging around in Wikipedia. It's like, wait a minute. I thought a SIM was a ROM. Uh, it, how can a ROM take over? Anyway, the location information of thousands of devices was obtained over time without the knowledge or consent of the targeted mobile phone users. During the attack, the user is completely unaware that they received the attack, that information was retrieved, and that it was successfully exfiltrated. However, 
the simjacker attack can and has been extended further to perform additional types of attacks. Simjacker has been further exploited to perform many other types of attacks against individuals and mobile operators such as fraud, scam calls, information leakage, denial of service, and espionage. Adaptive mobile security threat intelligence analysts observed the hackers varying their attacks, testing many of these further exploits. In theory, all makes and models of mobile phone are open to attack as the vulnerability is linked to a technology embedded in SIM cards. The SIM jacker vulnerability could extend to over 1 billion mobile phone users globally, potentially impacting countries in the Americas, West Africa, Europe, Middle East, and indeed any region of the world where this SIM card technology is in use. They finished, we're quite confident that this exploit has been developed by a specific private company that works with governments to monitor individuals. Adaptive mobile security has been working closely with the customers and the wider industry, including both mobile network operators and SIM card manufacturers to protect mobile phone subscribers. We've blocked attacks and are committed to using our global threat intelligence to build defenses against these new sophisticated attacks that are circumventing current security measures. So uh, I have a lot of information here, but I had to dig down further. So I found a, how does it work? They wrote the main SIM jacker attack involves an SMS containing a specific type of spyware like code being sent to a mobile phone which then instructs the SIM card within the phone to take over the mobile phone to retrieve and perform sensitive commands. So that repeats what I had said earlier. The attacks exploit the ability to send SIM toolkit messages and the presence of the S at sign T browser on the SIM card of vulnerable subscribers. And I thought, I thought, what? Maybe we are in the future. The S at sign T browser is normally used for browsing through the SIM card. The attack messages use the S at sign T browser functionality to trigger proactive commands that are sent to the handset. And it turns out that, that like the SIM is in line between the radio and the, uh, the rest of the phone handset functionality. Anyway, the responses to these commands are sent back from the handset to the SIM card and stored there temporarily. Once the relevant information is returned from the handset, another proactive command is sent to the handset to send out an SMS containing the information. So, so I thought, what the hell? A, an S at sign T browser of some kind on SIM cards? So at this point, I jumped over to Wikipedia to get a bit more back, background, uh, and that just made things worse. Wikipedia says, <laughs> yeah, SIM application toolkit, STK, is a standard of the GSM system, which enables the subscriber identity module, which is what SIM, S-I-M, stands for, to initiate actions, which can be used for various value-added services. Similar standards exist for other network and card systems within with the USIM application toolkit, which is USAT, for USIMs used by newer generation networks being an example. A more general name for this class of Java card-based applications running on UICC cards is the Card Application Toolkit. 
okay, so, you know, there's just way too much technology, which apparently some committee once upon a time said, oh, that'll be cool to have in there. Let's stick that in. And like nobody, everyone just kind of forgot about it. Anyway, so the SIM application toolkit, this SAT, which is in all GSM network phones, consists of a set of commands programmed into the SIM, which define how the SIM should interact directly with the outside world. What? And initiates commands independently <coughs> of the handset and the network. This enables the SIM to build up an interactive exchange between a network application and the end user and access or control access to the network. The SIM also gives commands to the handset, such as displaying menus and or asking for user input. Wow. It's like, it what? Who knew? Yes, yes exactly. Well, unfortunately, bad guys. Uh, STK has been deployed by many mobile operators around the world for many applications, often where a menu-based approach is required. Okay, you know, maybe back in the day of a flip phone where you actually had a text screen that you had to, like, scroll through or something, but it turns out everyone stopped using it, but it stayed in there. Um you know, and they give an example, like, uh, like such as mobile banking and content browsing. Designed as a single application environment, the SDK, this is still Wikipedia, can be started during the initial power-up of the SIM card and is especially suited to low-level applications with simple user interfaces. And they, and they finish what I'm quoting here saying, in GSM networks... The SIM application toolkit is defined by the GSM 11.14 standard released in 2001. So, yes, for the last 18 years. Then they said from release 4 onwards, GSM 11.14 was replaced by 3G PPTS 31.111 which also includes the specifications of the USIM application toolkit for 3 and 4G networks. So in other words, we all have it. And if our phone receives an SMS that was carefully crafted completely without our knowledge or permission, things can be done to our phone behind our back. Um, let me, let's see, the adaptive mobile security explained that their mobile threat analytic system allowed them to correlate the SIM jacker sources with known malicious threat actors. As a result, they can state with a high degree of certainty that the source is a large professional surveillance company with highly sophisticated abilities in both signaling and handsets. These types of companies exploit the fact that mobile operators may incorrectly regard core network security as solved if they deploy a standard GSMA compliant firewall. But that's not the case. So they've revealed the existence, they meaning adaptive mobile, the existence of the vulnerability and associated exploits that they call SimJacker. They believe this vulnerability has been exploited for at least the past two years by a highly sophisticated threat actor in multiple countries, primarily for the purpose of surveillance. Other than the impact on its victims from their analysis, SimJacker has a SimJacker and its associated exploits is a huge jump in complexity and sophistication compared to attacks previously seen over mobile core networks. Um, I've got a bunch more information about IMEI recovery, location, data messages, um, a, a big graphic here in the show notes showing 
the way on the way in the sim intercepts a an at- a sim jacker attack sms and essentially takes over the phone and is then able to probe uh, execute commands on the device obtain information back and then forward it out to uh, to an accomplished device and so it's it, it, at the minimum it's able to obtain location information, essentially pinging the phone without any notification of the user, but it's also able to play a tone, send a short message, set up a call, send uh, USSD information, uh, send SS, whatever that is, provide local information, the IMEI, the battery, the network, the language, et cetera, power off the card, run an AT command behind the user's back, send DTMF commands, launch browser, open a channel, send data, get service information, submit multimedia requests, uh, set up geogra- or uh, determine geographical, geographical location. Anyway, so they said by using these commands in our own tests, we were able to make targeted handsets open up web browsers, ring other phones, send text messages, and so on. These attacks could be used to fulfill such purposes as misinformation by sending SMS, MMS messages with attacker-controlled content, fraud by by dialing premium rate numbers, espionage, as well as a location-retrieving attack, an attack device could could ring another number, thus turning it into a listening outpost, uh, used for malware spreading by forcing the browser to open a web page with malware located on it, which it would then execute, denial of service by disabling the SIM card, or information retrieval, retrieve other information like language, radio type, battery level, and so forth. So basically, we all have this capability in any GSM network participating phone right now. So, uh, you know, all of those examples uh, that we see in the movies where the person takes a SIM card out, those suddenly <laughs> sound like a much better idea than, than they were before. Of course, you take the battery out too and the, and the phone is shut down. But anyway, and they will be uh, so if for no reason. I'll break it in half that, and throw it out. There. Uh, you got to crack it in half, Leo, to, just for dra- yeah. for dramatic well, effect. It breaks the yes. hinge. That's all you're doing. Okay, yes. Fine. <laughs> I do have another graphic in the show notes, which is interesting, which is a, a distribution. If you scroll way down uh, against a black field, a distribution of of tar- of attack targets that they have seen. So there is a, it's an extremely long tail, but, but a, but clearly a, uh, uh, a very few number of specific targets were receiving a high rate of, of probes about their location. They said in one country, we are seeing roughly 100 to 150 specific individual phone numbers being targeted per day via simjacker attacks. They said, although we have witnessed bursts of up to 300 phone numbers attempted to be tracked in a single day, the distribution of tracking attempts varies. So uh, anyway, th- this is being used for surveillance uh, in targeted attacks. And uh, the good news is it looks like these, these could be caught because they have to transit the 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 mobile phone network, and right now there are no firewalls that are blocking this from from happening. Basically, it means uh, getting smart about this at 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 the at the mobile phone infrastructure level. Because it's certainly not the case that all of our SIM cards are going to be replaced anytime soon. But boy, I mean, this looks like a capability that was over-designed once upon a time that had a brief window of usage and then nobody ever turned it off or took it away or shut it down. And uh, it's just a glaring vulnerability in GSM phones. Oh, only GSM? Yes. Only, well, GSM, 
SIM-based GSM, uh, I'm not enough of an expert in other non-GSM networks, but there, there are alternative SIM-like systems in, in non-GMS phone, uh, GSM phones. Right. There are SIMs in, L, in LTE phones, but you think that's a different kind of thing? or uh, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert enough to know. Yeah, um, interesting. I bet it is the same, but... Why would you know they never take out a capability, right? <laughs> when you can, right? When you can put in more, exactly. Wow. Mark, Mark says it's the same. He says the only thing resistant is CDMA. Mark's a uh, security expert, ah, cool. and fan. And does so, anyone use CDMA anymore? Does that go uh, away? You know, you have some older Verizon and Sprint handsets, maybe, but everybody's moved to LTE. Uh, CDMA over LTE in some cases, but I think you'd still be using the SIM. Yes, and in that case, the underlying the underlying transport would right. be uh, LTE still. Right. Wow. So anyway, uh, it's you not know, good. our listeners, not good. you know, in general, we don't have anything to worry about. It's nice that this came to light. Certainly, there are people somewhere whose location is at, well, and you can imagine that this is the kind of thing that law enforcement could ask a provider to provide for a given right. individual. We want to know where they are right now. And there can be an answer from virtually and virtually anybody can be targeted whose phone number is known. Right. By sending them an SMS message, their their phone will say, "Yep, here's where I am," and other stuff too. Wow. Wow. Just and of course hijacked for malicious purposes, not merely spying on you, but you know you can make money off of it. Right. Right. Oh, well, well, well. Isn't that special? Um, thank you, Steve, for really cheering up. <laughs> I think that's why people listen. They listen for the happy news here at Security Now. <laughs> and that's why they keep tuning in. They still haven't gotten any. Uh, we do this show every Tuesday, 1.30 Pacific, except when we're doing it in the, uh, you know, time zone shift thing. Yes, in the, uh, w w when we are... When our dropping time through <laughs> a spatial rift. When we're in the uh, Stargate, you never know right. when it'll be. But uh, So we have recorded the October 1st uh, show ahead of time, and I think we're going to record again on Saturday afternoon, right? Yes, we are. Okay. We're going to record on Saturday afternoon for uh, Tuesday. Because we, yep. so Steve's we'll be, headed out. When are, you, when are you leaving? I leave on Sunday. Wow. Okay. Steve's going on uh, his European tour to tell the world about Squirrel. By the way, Mark was at the event in... Um, where was it? Orange County. Orange County. And oh, cool. Said there were there were over a hundred people there, and you asked how many of you uh, listen to Security Now. And when everybody raised their hands, you said, "Well, let me put it this way: how many of you don't?" And it was three people. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I said, maybe you three should get a clue get because yes. you know everybody <laughs> else is listening. <laughs> I hope you all got that clue. If you uh, if you like security now, tune in. Uh, we do it live, as I said. We won't be for a couple of weeks, but normally it's uh, Tuesdays uh, at uh, one thirty p.m. Pacific, four thirty Eastern, twenty thirty UTC. You can watch live at li at twit.tv slash live. So we're not going to be back here until October eighth. Correct. October eighth. Correct. We'll be back on our regular schedule. But as I said, we're not missing an episode. We recorded. A uh, evergreen for October 1st, and we're going to do one on Saturday. If you want to watch that, by the way, that'll be about 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC, Saturday, right after the radio show. Steve Even if I. we have to bend the space-time continuum Again. to make it happen, Leo? Well, this one's not we so will... bad, because you're recording no. Saturday for Tuesday. Yeah, so there'll be a, a less dramatic snapback <laughs> when, the fabric, when, the, when the fabric restores. The rent is repaired uh, you can get copies of this episode. You know, <laughs> it's all in order on the website. Go to grc.com. <laughs> While you're there, you can not only get 16 and, and a kilobit version of this show, but 64 kilobit audio. You can also get a great transcription by Elaine Ferris. She writes it all down and makes it a lot easier to understand if you can read along. Uh, we also have uh, lots of other good stuff there, including Steve's Bread and Butter, Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility, grc.com. Steve can be messaged there, grc.com slash feedback, but you can also uh, add him on the Twitter. He's at SGGRC, and he takes uh, DMs as well there. So if you have something secret to tell him, at SGGRC. 
I will be also doing putting the show up on our website, twit.tv slash SN. And when I say I, I mean those guys down the hall. Because uh, <laughs> I'm out of here. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, twit.tv slash SN. Or best thing to do, you know what? You should all be doing this. Don't be one of those three people who says, I don't know what you're talking about. Subscribe. Find your favorite podcast application or subscribe on YouTube and you'll get it. The minute it's available in the proper order, the packets will be reordered for your convenience. <sighs> no buffering. Thank you, Steve. Okay, my friend, I will talk to you Saturday afternoon after right. the tech guy. All right. We'll see you then. Bye. Security now.